But the real problem, and this comes to the nub of the argument for me, is over the issues which I will describe as values and framing. Now, um, am I allowed to mention Sheffield Hallam? I, I've just done so, so it's too late. Um, um, in, in response to um, an article I wrote vaguely on this issue last week, Professor Lynn Crow from Sheffield Hallam wrote what I thought was a, a very thoughtful piece in which she said the following. She asked this question, how else can we address the challenge of convincing those who do not share the same values as ourselves of our case? In other words, we're trying to make a case to people who just don't care about the natural world. How do we convince them when they don't share those values of our case? And to me, the answer is very simple. We don't. We don't. We never have, and we never will. That is not how politics works. Tony was talking about Ed Miliband. Picture a situation where Ed Miliband stands up in the House of Commons and makes such a persuasive speech. Okay, this is getting surreal. Um, <laughs> it's such a persuasive speech that David Cameron says, you know, you've completely won me over. I'm crossing the floor and joining the Labour benches. It doesn't happen. That's not how it works. That's not how politics has ever proceeded. Except one or two uh, infinitesimally rare cases. You do not win your opponents over so that they come onto your side. What you do to be effective in politics is, first of all, to empower and mobilise people on your own side, and secondly, then to win over the undecided people in the middle. But the hard core of your opponents who absolutely do not share your values, you are not going to win over. It's not going to work. That's not how it works. And this is the horrendous mistake which New Labour here and the Democratic Party in the United States have made, where pursuing short-term goals, you know, like, we've got to win the next election, so we've got to appease people who don't share our values, so we're going to become like them. Instead of um, um, trying to assert our own values, we're going to go over to them and say, look, you know, we're not really red. We're not scary at all. We're actually, we're really conservatives. And that was Tony Blair's message. That, I'm afraid, is Barack Obama's message. It was certainly Bill Clinton's message. It's this whole approach of triangulation, which possibly won elections, so in 1997, a bucket on a stick would have won. Um, uh, but greatly eroded, in our case, the Labour vote across, across the intervening years. And we've ended up with a situation where there are effectively no political alternatives to the neoliberalism being advanced by the coalition government, where the opposition is, on almost every case, failing to oppose. And it is in that position because it has progressively neutralised itself by trying to appease people who do not share its values. And as George Lakoff, the, the man who has done so much, a cognitive linguist who has done so much to explain why progressive parties keep losing the elections that they should win and keep losing support even in the midst of an of, of a, of a, a, a economic crisis and environmental crisis and every other kind of crisis caused by their political opponents and why still they can't capitalise on them, as he points out, you can never win by adopting the values of your opponents, by trying to go across to meet them. You, you have to leave them where they are and then project your own values to people who might be persuaded to hear those values and might come over to your side. And that way, which is exactly what the Conservatives have done on both sides of the Atlantic, they've been extremely good at that, especially in the United States, where they basically cross their arms and say, right, we're here, we don't care, we don't give a damn about what you stand for, you hippies on the left. This is what we stand for and we're going to project it, project it, project it, project it until you feel that you have to come to us. And so what we've got there is a Democratic Party which is indistinguishable from where the Republicans were 10 years ago. It has gone so far to the right that it has lost its core values. And I think you can say the same about the Labour Party in this country. And that, in effect, is what we're being asked to do through this pricing of everything agenda, where we're saying because 
Our opponents don't share our values, and they're the people wrecking the environment. We have to go over to them and say, we like you, really. All we care about is money. We don't really care about nature for its own sake. We don't really believe in any of this intrinsic stuff. We don't believe in wonder and delight and enchantment. We just want to show you that it's going to make money. And, of course, you know, A, it's not going to work because they'll always, you know, the cost-benefit analysis will be rigged against it. But, B, so much more damagingly, we completely destroy our own moral authority and legitimacy and position in so doing. And it was very telling to me, and I was so pleased to see it, that in a recent interview, George Lakoff, who is the sort of the guy who really put this, this the formulation of values and as, as the absolute key to political success on the map, the thing which he singled out as making him groan most with utter despair, was the attempt to monetize nature in order to save it, where he was arguing that well-meaning people were trying to do the right thing, but were completely failing to apply a frame's analysis. A frame is the mental structure which you use to approach and understand an issue, a frame's analysis to what they were doing. And as a result, instead of framing it with their own values, and describing and projecting their values, which is the only thing in the medium to long term which ever works, they were throwing all those over, surrendering them, and going over to the values of the people who are wrecking the environment. And how could there be any long-term impact of that other than more destruction? Well, let me put it another way. There's another way of looking at this which comes says the same thing in different ways. All of us are a mixture, or we're somewhere along the spectrum, I guess you could say, between intrinsic values and extrinsic values. Now, extrinsic values are all about fame and image and money. It's about driving down the street in your Ferrari and showing, showing it to everyone, something obviously I do on a daily basis. Um, uh, it's, it's about having these external justifiers and motivators and seeing yourself in the light that other people see you in and, and requiring that approbation, that social approbation for your own sense of well-being. Intrinsic values are about being more comfortable with yourself, about who you are, um, about being embedded in your family, your, your community, among your friends, who, whoever you're with, and, and, and not requiring those, that constant show of, 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 sort of resource-holding potential, as biologists would call it, as sort of being the big man or the big woman with the hairy chest, uh, in the man's case, um, um, you know, showing that you are the alpha male or indeed the alpha female without the hairy chest, um, um, in, in order to, 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 to demonstrate um, uh, uh, to yourself, really, that, that, that you are worth something, which you, know, you need if you have a strong set of extrinsic values. And, and research in 70 countries produces remarkably consistent results that these values are very highly clustered. So, for instance, people who greatly value financial success tend to have much lower empathy than those with a strong set of intrinsic values, much um, less concern about the environment and the natural world. Um, they tend to have much more uh, of a tendency towards hierarchy, um, and, and status, uh, the, these, they're very, very strongly clustered. But we are not born with these values. They are the product, very largely, of our social environment, our social and our political environment. And what the research also shows is that if you change that environment, people's values shift en masse with that change. So if, for instance, you have what in the United States they dismissively call socialized medicine, and we call the NHS. You have a, a good functioning health system where no one is left behind, where everybody is treated. That embeds and imbues among the population a strong set of intrinsic values, because you say, oh, I live in a society where everyone's looked after. That must be a good thing, because that's the society that I live in, and you absorb and internalize those values. If, on the other hand, you live in a devil-take-the-hindmost society where people, as they do in the United States, literally die on the street because they cannot afford medical care, that um, will reinforce extrinsic values and push you further towards that end of the spectrum. And the more that spectrum shifts, 
the, the, the more the values shift with it. And, and you know, people on, on the right, they understand this very well. I mean, Mrs. Thatcher famously said, um, economics is the method, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, aren't I? Economics is a method, the object is to change the heart and the soul. She completely understood about changing people's values, something the left has never grasped. And if we surrender to the financial agenda, and if we say, oh, this market-led neoliberalism thing is the way forward, then we shift social values. Because let's face it, we, and I'm talking about environmentalists here, are among the last lines of defence against that gradual societal shift towards extrinsic values. And if we don't stand up and say, we do not share those values, our values are intrinsic values. We care about people. We care about the natural world. We, we, we are embedded in our communities and the people around us, and we want to protect them, not just ourselves. We are not going to be selfish. This isn't about money. Unless you do that, who else is going to do it? And so you say to me, well, what do we do instead? You know, you, you produce these arguments against trying to save nature by pricing it, by financialization, by monetization, by valuation, by all of these things. You produce these arguments. What do you do instead? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is no mystery. It is the same answer that it has always been, the same answer that it always will be, and the same thing we just cannot damn well be bothered to get off our bottoms to do. This is the only thing that works. In fact, there's three things that work. The three essential keys to all political change which apply to protecting the environment as much as they apply to everything else are in this order. Mobilization. Mobilization and mobilization. It's the only thing that ever works. And everything else is a fudge and a substitute and an excuse for not doing that thing that works. And that applies to attempts to monetize and financialize nature or anything else as much as it does to all the other political issues we are failing to get to grips with. Thank you.